pre-show, we always do a half hour. Well, not a half hour. Just a couple of minutes before. This is kind of like the green room. It's where, you know, if you're watching the Joe Rogan podcast, this is the part where he's talking to the people before, and then he says, now we have to change the conversation, and they laugh together. And it's like, yeah, it's fine. Okay, so <laughs> before we dive into the real stuff, it looks like we're live there. That's good. That's all I really wanted to see. Cup, nothing in it. The Q stands for Quiney. C'est moi, Adam Quiney. Let's do the live pouring of the tea. It's happening. There's a nice, hot, steamy stream of tea. Look at that tall pour right over my keyboard. This would be the perfect time for me to spill tea all over my keyboard. It'd be a different kind of live show. All right, that's poured. I'm going to slide this over just a little bit. Oh, there you go. Good morning, Sheriff Hat. Good morning, everyone. Have a sip. I'm fresh back from a trip through the Canadian Rockies. Ben and I were originally going to be down in San Diego for an event called Secret Knock, uh, which is kind of like this cool gathering of cool people up to all kinds of things around the world. My friend Nathan Minahan, who does custom suits and shoes and stuff, you've seen me share some of his shoe designs or the designs I've created using his website um, here on the show. He put me in touch with this group and the name of secret knock, the idea is like, you have to have a secret knock to get in. Secret knock, it's cool, cool people. I'm back from the trip, Sheriff Hat, yeah. So we were originally gonna fly down to San Diego for that, but as Delta surged and um, things just felt a little, like they were getting a little crazier, we thought we could do this. We could totally make this happen, but it doesn't feel like now is yet the time for us to start traveling across the border. Why don't we switch this and just stay in our country? And so instead, we took a road trip across British Columbia, which is the westernmost province of Canada, and um, made our way through the Rockies and um, up into the sort of mountains of uh, the border between British Columbia and Alberta. And what's really cool about that is um, a lot of BC's original, uh, I guess we'd call them like settlements, were created because of resources. So there was mining in particular mountains or there's a lot of logging that was being done because it's a very forested area. And so you have all of these small little settlements that exist, you know, not too far from one another where a town grew because there was like a mill or there was like logging and then you'd put the logs into the lake and then steamship the lake, the logs somewhere else or whatever, or, you know, whatever the, the case may be. And so what's really cool from that is you get to see these neat little villages as you drive through that are be a settlement of about maybe 200 people living their lives, doing whatever. You drive through that and you get into the next place. And so we saw some really, really cool places, um, picked up some really neat pieces of art. Um, we found in where we, in Nelson, um, which is a town in the interior of British Columbia, it was a super cool town with a really neat history. Um, Nelson was most widely known for marijuana for a long time. Uh, good weed. <laughs> and then a lot of people smoking it there. Um, which is the case for most of BC, really. Uh, but what happened was during the Vietnam War, a lot of the people dodging the draft in the States came up and moved to Nelson. That's where a lot of them settled, draft dodgers, as they were called. And what that provided was an influx of typically young, educated people, people that had some kind of degree, some kind of education, and did not believe in the war, did not want to fight in it, and did not believe in the draft. And so they left their country to dodge the draft, come up and settle in Nelson. And what that created is a town that had a lot of culture as a result. You had a lot of educated younger people all living together in this place, smoking weed. So there's a lot of artistic stuff. And so one of the things we picked up um, when we go on these trips, we like to find esoteric stuff to decorate with. And we found this place called the Kootenai Crate Company, and they make mini crates. Look at how small this crate is. What a miniature crate. And then they also have cool colors. And then here's a slightly less mini crate. But isn't that cool? What a beautiful crate. I guess if I'm like, you know, if I was moving this, this can of bubbly water, I could put it in this crate and then I can move it effectively and then set it down there. And then I can take it out of the moving crate. So it's all contained in a crate. Anyhow, I'm not sure what we'll use these for. We'll find something cool. We got a couple of this color, a couple of this color, and a couple of natural color. Um, I, I really like, you know, part of the way I like to 
create or decorate is I buy stuff. Here's the, another mini one of the more aqua color. So you've got kind of like a turquoise, I mean, this teal color. I like to buy stuff that aesthetically appeals to me that I think is neat, that I like, and then find out, you know, as, as time goes on, like, where does that fit into our house rather than here's the house all finished. Now where, what's the one thing that we need to find? It's more fun this way, more serendipitous. Uh, so did that. Um, we spent some time in a town called Banff, which is a very popular tourist destination. I think it's one of the most widely visited places in all of Canada. And we also went to uh, an area called Lake Louise. If you follow my Instagram, uh, which is Adam underscore Quiney, you might have seen some of the photos. Lake Louise is this really cool, it's a ski resort, but the lake itself is way up in the mountains and you have mountains on either side that come right down to the edge of the lake. And then there's a big glacier at the end of it. And the water is just the most pristine blue. The water is literally this color of blue. This is really, really beautiful. Um, and then we made our way back home yesterday. There's a lot of driving, probably about four hours a day. Uh, how many of this can of drink can this, are you talking about this miniature crate, Sheriff Hat? How many of this can could it put in? We could probably put in two and a half of these into this, this mini crate. Hello, Raph. Good morning. Who else is here? There's seven people watching. I want to get some names, get some names in that chat so that I can give you a shout out. That's what we're here for, right? Is the shout outs. So it was a really fun trip, really uh, neat. What Bay and I do is we buy uh, an audiobook usually, Agatha Christie. We were listening to Hercule Poirot, which if you don't know, is an awesome detective. Agatha Christie wrote a lot of books about, very arrogant, but very smart. So we listen to that as we drive and uh, just enjoy the scenery and, and do all that sort of stuff. And it's good to be home and not sitting in a car doing this sort of stuff. Good morning, America. Nice to see you again. I'm gonna turn a fan on. That's step one here. It's going to get hot. Let's get that fan running. Sit down there. We've got good topics. I'm excited to talk about these. Um, also, today is the final post from the Energetic Laws of Leadership. So if you've not been following those, that's a series of about, not about, it's a series of nine energetic laws governing the way leadership works. And what those laws are, are um, they're kind of a, an explanation for the way things like karma work or the, the reason and, and the explanation for why we have sayings like what you resist persists. Well, that sounds good. It rhymes. So I could just take it on faith. But why? Why is that the case? And what those energetic laws do is they help you see how that actually operates it doesn't necessarily mean then you'll just start honoring them. You're still going to have some like maybe some doubt or like, ah, I don't know, or yeah, that sometimes works. But what it does is it kind of distinguishes it. It lets you actually see and really understand, oh, no wonder the thing that I'm striving to eliminate from the world seems to persist. No wonder people always seem to be hypocrites. That's explained by those laws. So, um, hey, Heather. Uh, I'm just going to look up energetic laws of leadership. I just want to share the link, uh, Adam Quiney, so that you've got it because um, we're now finished writing those. And um, I'm going to share with you the post that, that lets you read all of them. So they're all available off of kind of one mother post. There's one sort of like main post, and then it lists the nine laws as summary, and then you can link to all of those. So I just want to get those into the chat for you. Oh, here it is. Boom. Copy that. Put that here. Boom. You're Geld. Good morning, Vicky. Hey, Tommy. Oh, I posted that to YouTube, but not Facebook. Well, post it to Facebook. I guess I have to go over here to post it to Facebook. I can do that. Yeah, just put it right here. Uh, I have to click this. I have to wait. I have to well, mute. To Facebook, I guess. That, and then I, I just pump this right here. here. Boom. There we go. It's all working good now. We're, we're getting this all handled. Good morning, Andy. Good morning, Andrew. Oh, that's cool. Andrew, been listening to a lot of my coaching calls on YouTube. I had a request recently that um, someone 
asked me to do more coaching with people that don't have a background in coaching, which is something I'm very eager to do. The challenge is when I ask people who would like to volunteer, it tends to be mostly coaches that put their hands up. So I'm, I am looking to see how do we bring more people that are not familiar with coaching, more people that are less involved in their own work into that space. The challenge, the other challenge is that it's a vulnerable thing to be willing to put your hand up and say, yeah, I'm down for this, especially when you don't even really know what you're getting into. Uh, if, if you've been through some coaching before, you're kind of like, okay, I know how this works. I, I feel somewhat like my feet are on the ground. Whereas for someone who's never had any experience with that can be very edgy. So I am looking into that, trying to create some, some way that we can have more than just coaches show up in that conversation. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's start talking about these, these topics that I promised you I was going to talk about. We've got great topics. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Sharifat. Thank you, Raf, for your suggestions. Um, let's start with the first, the second, the last question you asked, Andrew, which is uh, this idea of being a clearing for someone. What does it mean to be a clearing as a leader? And I'll begin, we're going to dive into that a bit, but if you want a more in-depth kind of um, separate conversation about this, you can search um, for that in my podcast. So there's an episode in my podcast where we really talk about what does it mean to be a clearing as a leader? And if you just search, I think you'd have to search get lit and clearing maybe and Adam Quiney. I don't know how the Google works, but that's probably going to help you find that podcast. I don't have it handy. So... Um, our clearing is, let me see, how do I set this up? Our clearing is something that we naturally, um, almost like energetically put out from ourselves. It's, it's a expansion of the way I be in the world that sort of allows certain things to show up around me and other things are less inclined to show up. That sounded like a whole bunch of gobbledygook. gook. So I'm going to try to make it a little more clear, but we kind of, in explaining this, I have to start with the gobbledygook so we can start to chip away and get it a little more clear. Like, okay, here's the statue that we're trying to create. So we're, we're Michelangelo-ing in, in this. Often when um, leaders are beginning to learn how to take more responsibility in their life, one of the places they get stuck is they're like, ah, Adam, I'll just come up with some examples. Adam, as soon as I leave the office, everyone stops working. Or we might say like, well, how can you be responsible for the fact that your team continues to show up and do poor quality work? Like, you know, just enough, just good enough work. How can you be responsible for that? And they say, I don't know. I do everything. I tell them to do it. I try micromanaging. It doesn't work. I, there's, I've looked everywhere. There's nothing else that I can see. So what the leader is typically doing at this point in their their own internal conversation and the conversation with someone supporting them is they're looking through the lens of like, what have I done? What have I done and what haven't I done? And that's where my responsibility ends. And that for the most part is how we operate day to day. Like our default in terms of responsibility is what did you do? What didn't you do? That's what there is to be responsible for. Taking on the notion of a clearing is about expanding our responsibility. And so, of course, to the extent we have responsibility conflated with blame, to the extent that I hold, if I'm responsible for something, it might mean that's my fault. To that extent, I'm also going to be resistant to this idea of a clearing. So if you are following along and you start to notice like, well, I don't like this, that's totally fine. Share that with me. Put it into the space so we can work with that. But it's also understandable. Most people have resistance as we start to expand our capacity to be responsible for more. So the notion of my clearing is kind of best described in the term, like in, in the saying that people don't, well, the, the colloquial version of this is that people don't do what you say, they do what you do. And you, you've, I think this is common like parenting advice too. Your children don't do what you say, they do what you do. So they watch you and then they do the same stuff you do. That's actually not even the full picture. What's really happening is people don't do what you say. They don't do what you do. They, they be how you be. 
So whatever you model in terms of your being, that's going to be what people respond to, pick up on, and has guide their actions. So if you, let's say um, you've got a story. Let's say you're someone who's really radiant. And you've learned growing up that, hey, Abril, nice to see you. You've learned growing up that your radiance was a problem. You were too much. Your natural quality, your natural tendency to just draw attention, to get noticed, and your desire to be noticed, because that's an expression of who you are innately, all of that, you were trained is too much. And so who you're being in the world from there, years later, as this has progressed and everything, how you've learned to be in the world is to diminish your presence, your radiance. You are going to shrink out of the space. Now, let's imagine that you are in a job as a leader and you're trying to support a staff member to like um, show up and take up her space so that she's taken seriously by your stakeholders. And you sit down with that staff member and you're like, listen, Ronnie, you got to like show up. You got to let your voice be heard. You've got to really enunciate. You've got to make this yourself heard. So you're giving this feedback to Ronnie. But simultaneous to that, when you show up in meetings, you diminish your presence naturally. You find ways, you might even speak with a powerful voice, but then do things like, this is just my opinion, but that's a way of diminishing your radiance. You qualify yourself. I'm really sorry to interrupt, and I know I keep doing it, but I feel I just have to say blah, 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 blah. Or maybe you rush through your words so that you can say what you have to say, but get out of that spotlight as quickly as possible. So all of these, the doing looks different in each of these cases, but underneath it, the being is consistent. The being is... I don't want to take up space. It's wrong for me to take up too much space. I am too much. And all of the stuff layered on top of that that shows up on the surface are variations on the theme of managing that story about who you be, how it's wrong for you to take up space, how it's wrong for you want to take up space, all of that sort of stuff. And so you can give all the feedback in the world to Ronnie. You can be like, ah, Ronnie, you got to show up, man. You got you to gotta put yourself on the line. You got to be willing to stand firm in your space. And what Ronnie's going to learn from is watching you and how you be. You can tell him that as much as you want. That's our clearing as a leader. In this example, you're clearing what you energetically emanate from yourself is that it's wrong to take up too much space. And if you have to take up space, do it quickly, do it subtly, ideally, and even better, don't do it at all. Get someone else to take up the space. That's a clearing. So what tends to happen is when, when, if I was working with this leader, we'll call her Glenda. Glenda's the one developing the leadership of Ronnie. And Glenda comes to me and says, Adam, it's so annoying. I have tried my, my very best to get Ronnie to show up, to take space. It's what's next for him. I want to develop his leadership. And yet he keeps sabotaging. He doesn't do it. He doesn't show up. He talks quietly. He mumbles. He doesn't make eye contact with people when he speaks, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to ask Glenda, great, what can you be responsible for? And Glenda's default reaction, her, her sort of automatic a- answer is, I don't know. I've looked at everything. I've told him. I've sat him down. I've even paid for classes for him to take where it teaches you how to speak more powerfully in Toastmasters and blah, 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 blah. And what Glenda can't see is the clearing she's creating. And our clearing will always, um, our clearing will always defeat any any sort of like training or or order that we try to give. If I tell you, Ronnie, I'm going to hit you in the back of the head unless you speak loudly and take up space, he might practice with that, but my clearing that it's wrong to take up a lot of space is always going to be determinative. That is the thing, the bedrock of our leadership, and it's hard for us to see. Andrew, you're asking, I see. So if we are being a clearing for someone else, then let's let's just get this up here. Andrew saying, if we're being a clearing for someone else, then is it allowing them to share what they need to share in that space? The question is, so it's not, am I being a clearing for someone or am I not being a clearing for someone? The actual inquiry we want to be in is, what am I a clearing for? So what that means is like, imagine a leader who shows up late to work three times a week and berates his staff when they show up late to work. 
what is that leader a clearing for? What is the clearing that gets created? So the clearing that I would assert gets created, what we want to do is look at how this leader is being. And the way they're being is they tell you to do one thing and then don't do that thing themselves. So they're actually a clearing for being late and punishing other people for being late. They're a clearing for a degree of hypocrisy. They're a clearing for kind of like, look, we're going to tell the people we're leading to do one thing, but we're going to make exceptions for ourselves. And so what's going to happen is from that clearing, the people they're leading are going to show up the exact same way because that's the clearing for them to step into. See you later, Heather. Thanks for sticking around for this little bit. So they're going to kind of like, they're going to watch that. And they're going to be like, oh, so when I'm observed by the leader who's going to hit me in the back of the head, I got to show up and do this stuff. But for my people, there I get to make some exceptions. And that's the clearing that gets created. And that trickles all the way down our organization. Here's another example. Leaders often want to really do work on their culture because most culture sucks. And people are like, I don't understand why, but our culture is X, Y, and Z, and it's not working, and we need to work through this. So the best way to look at what is the culture of your company is to look at you. How do you show up? How do you be as a leader? That's the culture you're creating. So one of the examples for this would be leaders who try to create companies where there's like, you can take as much vacation as you want, but the leader themselves never takes vacation. That creates a clearing. The clearing that creates is, yeah, we have the freedom to do whatever we want, but don't do it. And so then you can imagine, right, that's going to create this weird kind of dissonance, like a, a, a bit of a contradictory message. Oh, I have freedom to do anything I want. I just can't actually act on it. I could, but I can't. I, I, I might, I, if I chose, I could do it, but I'm not going to choose it. And so the clearing created in that example is sort of like we talk about our freedom, but we don't actually act on it, which is basically not freedom. Unless you actually embody it, talking about it, saying you have the capacity to do stuff like this is irrelevant. Who cares? I can say that. I could say I can walk around the streets of Victoria naked today. I have that freedom, but I don't because I'm not going to because there's going to be consequences, so on and so forth. So all of these are examples of the clearing that we create. And our clearing is the most important aspect of our leadership. It's the energetic quality, so to speak, that we kind of put into the world. And that's what people respond to. Now, I'm not, when I say energetic, I don't mean like, I don't mean you think a certain way and then your brain waves kind of like ripple out through the ether and then land in someone else's brain and then controls their thoughts. That's not really what I mean by uh, energetic. What I mean is when I talk about something being like an energetic quality, I mean that there's like a whole bunch of subtleties that have this energy go all the way out and then come back around. So that Josh, or sorry, Josh, Josh just asked a question. That leader that I mentioned, just calling you out, Josh, that leader that I mentioned they're going to defend. They're like, no, but I tell people to take all the vacation that they want. Yeah, but your energy is not in alignment with that. Your energy is I tell people one thing, but there's a different set of rules that apply to me. And so that then we could draw a box around that. And that becomes the, the culture of your company is we tell people one thing, but there's a different set of rules that apply to me. That energetically just magic that gets created and created and created. Monica, I'm going to read what you said here, Monica. I'm coaching a team and the leader takes up so much space. He's charismatic and very big. His team are all afraid to take up space. How does this fit into what you were, sp you were saying? Right. So I'm going to make some assumptions here, but it sounds like we've got a leader with a great deal of presence. They take up a lot of space, very charismatic. And so when you have someone taking up all of the space, it doesn't leave much room for anyone else. And so the clearing for that leader will be, there is room for me. I take up space, you don't take up space. And I want to be clear, if the leader's like, I want to run a company where I'm the one that takes up all the space, and they're empowered by that, and they're clear on the consequences of that, and they're still choosing it, great. We don't have to do any work. 
But if this leader you're describing, Monica, is like, ah, no one in my company ever takes up space and I tell them to take up space and they never do, then where we want to look is what's the clearing that this leader is creating. And it sounds like the clearing that this leader is creating is I take up the space. And if you want to take up space, you're going to have to fight me for it. You're going to have to like interrupt me. And who knows what's going to happen when he does that. I would guess it's not very pretty because this probably resides in their blind spot. So their clearing is don't take up space, leave space for me. I'm the one that takes up the space. And then consequently, that's going to create that same dynamic down the chain. So you've got the leader taking up all the space and then the people that sit and wait until he finishes talking. Then you could just draw a box around that and that's going to go to the next level of leadership. So those same people waiting for their leader to stop talking so they can fill some space they're now going to show up kind of like the flip of that with their direct reports. So they're going to take up all the space with their direct reports who are going to wait for the leader to stop talking and so on down the chain, all the way down the chain. So that's a clearing for people not taking up space. Does that make sense, Monica? Let me know if that kind of aligns for you, if that, if that kind of fits into what we're talking about. And Josh says, what is the opportunity of walking down the streets of Victoria naked though? I don't know, Josh, you should, you figure that out for me. That's not possibility I care to explore. Um, Andrew says, I see a connection with the clearing to the innate qualities of an individual, that the more someone gets connected to those qualities, it becomes a clearing in and of itself. Still trying to connect the dots, but very interesting. Well, tell me more about that, Andrew. I, I, See if you can elaborate on that for us. I'm not totally clear on, I, I have a sense, but like, I want to let you connect those dots for me rather than me just making some assumptions. And Monica, if you can be more clear what you mean, I don't think that second part is actually happening. That would be great. Let me know what you mean by, I don't think that second part is actually happening. What we want to understand is that we are always a clearing for something. Always. So if someone is frustrated that people always, uh, let me give you an example. On LinkedIn, someone had written a post saying, she'd quoted something her client had said, which was, I just wanna be around more people I can trust. That's what her client had said. And so she kind of wrote it like, yeah, trust is really important. And what I wrote is like, what does your client see through the lens of trust and responsibility? My question to this poster is an invitation to go a little deeper than, yeah, you got to find the right people that you can trust. Now we're going to bring this into the context of a clearing. So this client who says, I want to be around people I can trust. The thing we would be curious about if we were looking through the lens of leadership and a clearing is how is this person a clearing for betrayal of trust? Because this person has a complaint. I would assert. And the complaint is, I'm, there's, it's so hard to find people that I can trust. Great. How are you a clearing for that? How do you create a space in which people that are untrustable naturally find themselves drawn into and hanging out with you? How are you a clearing for having your trust betrayed over and over and over again? So notice, rather than have this become a thing about like, yeah, how could you find out if people are trustable or not and then sort what life brings you so that you only allow in the people that you can trust, we're flipping it. We're making this entirely an internal thing. How are you a clearing for a lack of trust? How do you create that in your life? And from there, we can start to look at like, you know, maybe I'm just making stuff up. Maybe this person goes out and just their, their starting point for everyone is I totally trust this person. They're almost like um, everyone gets a honeymoon period. Oh my God, I trust everyone. And then, of course, that leads to the fact that sometimes they get betrayed. Maybe they, um, what would be another way we could see this happen? Maybe they show up looking right out of the gate for how someone's going to betray them. And if we look at anything under a microscope, we're going to start to see it. And since I'm waiting for you to betray me, it's almost like it's just a matter of time before I'm going to betray you. I already know it's going to happen. So I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm hanging out around you ready for you to slip up. And I'm also like, well, if I can't trust you, why should I be trustable around? Like, why should this go the other way? 
So I'm maybe I'm willing to cut an angle with you as well, which is then going to create this sort of reciprocality of a lack of trust. So all of this fits inside my clearing. How am I a clearing for a lack of trust to show up? Are there points where really I should start to question, you know, there's evidence showing up. Maybe this person is not the one that I should trust. And instead I choose, I'm going to trust them anyhow. What do you know? A lack of trust. Maybe I have a story that it's impossible to get into business with people that are really trustable. So instead, I'm just going to, I'm going to settle for the fact that I can't get into business with people that are really trustable. I'll just keep one eye open when I'm sleeping with the people I am in business with. And so that is going to create a clearing for a lack of trust to show up in my life. I've kind of already decided, well, I can't have trust here. So I'm going to do the next best thing, which is like kind of choose into these crappier relationships I don't trust and then blah, 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 blah. Um, Andrew saying, it's like if I'm wanting others to show up more authentically and vulnerable, how am I clearing for people to stay reserved or closed off? Exactly. That's exactly it, Andrew. So it's our clearing is an opportunity to take a look on our side of the fence. How am I creating this? When people um, complain about someone having like someone hanging out in small talk or like, oh, I hate going to networking events because they're all just small talk. How are you a clearing for just small talk at an event? How do you show up in such a way that that has you see the world through that lens, has you experience everything through that lens? So really it's like that which we would complain about, we can take a look through the lens of our clearing. How am I clearing for that to show up? How is the way I'm being as a leader, regardless of what I'm up to, drawing more of this in and kind of letting it hang out? Hey, Evan, good morning. Um, Monica, I think, so what Monica is saying, it seems like most of the people in the example she's provided are still reserved. So remember we had like the leader who's very charismatic and takes up all the space. And then you've got the people underneath him who are reserved and waiting for someone to get out of the way. So it's not always like a direct mirror down the line. It can, it can show up differently. Like ultimately this leader is training people around him to be quiet and to expect someone else to take up the space. So one of the things that can kind of happen is you end up with the second level managers are waiting for someone else to take up the space. And then you have people below them that kind of occur like their leader above. So you get, you know, the people below that they're leading are taking up all the space. And that way the second level manager stays reserved throughout. They're reserved for the people above them who take up all the space and they're reserved for the people below them who take up all the space. And so that way you get kind of like this staggered thing where you have person above taking up all the space, person below not taking any space up and then flip it on its head, person above not taking any space, person below taking up all the space. And then that's going to recreate, you know, the same dynamic at the top now exists two levels down. So it can, it can work that way too. Um, this feels a little murky as I'm trying to distinguish it uh, because I haven't yet sat down and really, um, I've, I've not really done a rigorous like explanation of clearing, uh, which as I'm going through this and your questions, Monica and Andrew are really helpful because it tells me like, ah, it would be really good for me to, to like sit down and really distinguish this with some rigor so we can talk about it a little bit more. A lot of this stuff, um, I was trained in initially through accomplishment coaching, which is the work I led for about five years, developing leadership, training coaches. And uh, a lot of this, the way it was trained was kind of, um, we would get this idea of a clearing and then coached on it. But there wasn't a point where someone was like, here is the definition of a clearing. Here is how this operates. Here's the way, kind of like the energetic laws, this happens and what this allows and what this stops. So we had like a nice, there was never a nice rigorous contextual framework. There was never a, a, an amount of language around this to make it really clear and crystallized and then to be coached into that. Instead, it was just sort of like we were coached into this notion, coached to show up a certain way and then you know, that's really great. It's like someone putting you on a bike and teaching you how to ride a bike without ever explaining any of the physics behind it. And part of the reason they're going to want to do that is because the physics can become a great distraction. You can get lost in like, but why is it that you must turn your handlebars a little bit to the left 
before you turn to the right. Why does that have to happen? I don't understand. Tell me about that. I'll get on the scary bike later on, but for now. So their approach was largely put you on the bike. Have you ride the bike? Put you into leadership. Have you practiced leadership? We'll use a concept, but we're not going to actually, you know, we're going to avoid rigorously describing it because, and the more I've deepened my own work and, and worked with people on both sides of that, that equation of like rigorously defining it versus just creating in the moment, the more I think that there's a real opportunity for both of those things. When I went and worked with Werner Earhart in his Being a Leader course in Cancun, one of the things that really blew my mind was how rigorously in language, a lot of the stuff that I'd learned through training in the moment, how rigorously they had it defined. Like as an example, I'd been trained a lot on this idea of getting someone. And getting is ultimately a way we listen as a leader that is deeper and different from what we typically do as humans. This doesn't mean only leaders can do this. Anyone can do this, but it's not how we're trained. So the way we typically listen to people is I have my position, you have your position, and I'm going to listen very carefully to the words you say. Ideally, I'm even going to be able to regurgitate the words to you once you finish talking as a defense, if you say that you don't feel like I'm listening. What happens is I'm staying in my position and I'm listening to what you have to say through the lens of my own position. You think that we should vote conservative. I think we should vote liberal. Why don't you explain to me why you believe that we should vote conservative? I'm going to listen to everything you say, but I'm going to stay rooted firmly in my entrenched position that liberal is the right way to vote. By the way, I don't care how you vote, do whatever you like. <laughs> But in this example, I listen to everything you tell me about why you would vote conservative through the lens of liberal is the right way. And that kind of listening is only, it's never going to be as impactful as really getting someone. Really getting someone means that I release my position entirely. I set aside this notion that there's a right way to vote, that liberal is better than conservative, all of that. And this requires some training and some work and, and some like so on and so forth. It's not free. It's not just like, great, I've let that go. But the leader does the kind of work required to be able to release that position so they can listen to this person like with a, a beginner's mind. What if there's no right answer? How do I hear this person and really get myself over there with them? And that's hard for us because we're worried if we abandon our own position and sit over there with them, we will get like, we'll lose our sovereignty. We'll lose ourselves. We might buy into their belief and we don't like the way their belief occurs because of our own belief. And so there's a requirement, like a degree of courage required to get over on their side and to look at the world and to really hear what they have to say in such a way that it makes complete sense. Not complete sense like this makes complete sense. They're just uneducated and they were raised with abuse. So of course they'd vote that way. Not that fucking complete sense. Complete sense like, oh my God, this I can completely understand. From from where we are right now, I would vote this way too. This I absolutely get this. That kind of listening, it it disarms the person. It leaves the person like, oh, I don't have to hold on to this defensively because someone's trying to move me off my position. This person's over here with me. And from there, we can actually if the leader is willing to release their position and come over here with the other person and really get them, then that allows that person they're supporting to release their position as well. So this is this notion of getting. None of this was articulated or distinguished for me in my training. What happened was I would sit with someone and I would try to listen to them and I'd be like, okay, yeah, I can kind of see why you want to quit or why you blah, blah, blah. That makes sense. And, and the person developing my leadership would be like, okay, Adam, it doesn't like, I hear you using those words, but it doesn't sound like you really get them at all. So why don't you try setting down blah, 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 blah. And so the support I got was like, what is in the way of me getting there in this moment? Adam, let that go. Now try again. And I'd try again. And they'd be like, okay, that's better. That's better. How do you feel over there? Well, I don't know. I feel kind of like he's just putting up with me. Okay. Can you get that feedback, Adam? Fine. Yes. Fuck you. <laughs> so that's how they would support me to do it instead of ever giving me that framework. And so in working with Werner, I really got the value 
of rigorously lining this stuff out. And so clearing, that's a long story to say, I can really see the value in distinguishing clearing the same way. So it can kind of become a lot more clear and we're like, oh, got it. That makes sense. So thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Andrew, for your questions. I'm just going to read what you guys have written here. Evan, you're calling everyone slippery scoundrels these days after I said that to you a few weeks ago. It's super effective. Great. Glad that's my clearing. And Monica, you say um, like kind of like that thing we described where the, the levels one and three replicate the same behavior and levels two and four replicate the reactive behavior, the behavior that's the reaction or the response to, like with parents and grandparents. Yes, exactly. Um, Carla, hey, Carla, nice to see you. Listen to really get the person not to be right about your own belief. Exactly. And Evan sharing... Um, Let's get you up there. We're so fucking tricky when we listen, quote unquote, through our filters while silently judging the person and making them wrong, even though we're listening the way we're supposed to as leaders. This is this idea of, of listening so as to get someone is so challenging because we don't want to abandon our position. And often, especially when people hurt us and we feel righteous, righteousness really robs us of the ability to get another person. Because what righteous does is it it ultimately kind of, it entrenches us in our position. It's not just that I have a position, it's I have a position and I'm fucking right about it. And you're fucking wrong about it. That is the end of that. And from there, why would I abandon my position? I'm right. So one of the real challenges and brilliance, brilliant people often have created strategies in their life from their shadow to be really good at being right. So in terms of the pathway to leadership and transformation for people with the quality of brilliance, this is a big one, is to really recognize when we're being really righteous, when we're being really right about something and practicing setting that down. Because when a brilliant person is right about something, it's not usually that they're just like, yeah, I'm right. It's like, I'm right. And they've built a case and they have a file. And it's like they're setting up in a courtroom, taking file after file and setting it down and be like, okay, let's hear. They're still taking files out. Let's let's hear your, I want to hear how you hold this. You're looking at this table of 58 documents and dossiers they put out. I mean, like, this person's not going to listen to a damn thing that I say. I'm going to bring this back to the idea of a clearing just to finish this up here. I Bay and I were supporting this leader. He never ended up working with us, which is quite unfortunate. But he he was very brilliant and the poster child for this. And what happened was he was absolutely committed to this notion of an open door policy and listening to what his staff had to say. And he would do the same with us. We could distinguish this because he brought that same energy to us. So he'd be like, hey, I have a reflection for you. And he'd be like, great, by all means, enlighten me. Mm, Uh-oh. And we'd offer that. And then he would listen and then be like, I don't think that's the thing. Which is sort of like standing in like... There's a degree of trust. We have to trust that Adam and Bay are deep enough in their work that their reflection has some merit. And from if you're willing to adopt that, and if not, you shouldn't even be talking about to us in the first place. It's a little bit like standing in front of the mirror and the mirror is like, here's how that scarf looks with that shirt and going, mm, I think you're wrong. I'm going to go out on my day. It looks different than what I'm seeing right here, which is self-defeating. Don't even have a mirror if that's the case. And so... That, again, is that leader's clearing, is the clearing they are creating is we listen to what you have to say. We are totally about listening to what you have to say, and none of it will make any difference unless it aligns with what I've already decided is correct. And so imagine the kind of culture that clearing creates. That clearing creates a culture where everyone is like, or where the energy of the culture is totally, let's hear what you have to say, and hopefully it aligns with what I already believe to be true. We are wide open for feedback, but none of it's going to make any kind of impact unless it's already in alignment with what we have determined to be true. And, you know, we can start to derive out from this, like what would be the impact of working in a culture like that? Well, one, you're going to pretty quickly decide what's the point of bringing feedback? Why would I bother bringing challenging feedback that requires some kind of energy from me to deliver when it's either already what we're aligned with, or it's just going to kind of like, thanks for your feedback and bounce off of the leader. So that creates a culture where people stop providing feedback. 
And then if we go back up to the leader at the top, he's frustrated because he's insisting, I'm willing to listen to people's feedback and I, I'm a demand for it and I ask for it and they're just not doing so. And then they quit with complaints. And I'm like, why didn't you bring this complaint? They didn't bring the complaint because this is your clearing, my friend. This is the impact you are creating as a leader in spite of the fact that you are insisting in terms of your doing and what you say that you want feedback. Your being is, but only the feedback that I've already decided I agree with. So there's the clearing. That's how that kind of operates. America, it's a tricky one for all of us, tricky to define and tricky to take ownership of because it it is like, it's like an iceberg. We can see that bit above the surface. The top 10% of the iceberg is our saying and our doing. It's what we said and what we did and what we didn't say and what we didn't do. We can see that. Our clearing is like the 90% below the surface of the water, below the surface of our consciousness, our awareness. And so much of what there is for us to be responsible for as a leader lies in that area. And so much of it goes unseen. And thus we are oblivious to it. And thus we are unable to really have any impact on it. We're unable to actually be responsible for it or do anything with it. Okay. Um, last thing I'm going to say, Andrew, is it can be a little confusing because you are learning an exercise called the clearing exercise. There's a lot of ways you can define that, but the way I hold it is like what I'm doing is I'm getting clear on what's in my space. What am I projecting energy energetically? So if I wake up and my crappy stories about myself are I suck and I'm a loser, that's going to be in my clearing. Some of that energy about myself is going to come out into the world. And so when you take on that clearing exercise, you're getting clear on it. Oh, that's what's there for me. That's part of what I'm bringing into every conversation, at least by default. There's a story that I suck and I'm a loser. Okay. Um, Sherifat asked me to talk about allowing versus forcing. So let's do that. It'll be a bit of a quickie, I think, this one. Um, so... Anytime, well, here's the heart of transformation is that children are born onto this planet transformed. The way that Buckminster Fuller put it is he said, everyone is born a genius. And then 99.99% of us are immediately degeniusized by the world around us. This should not be construed as a criticism of like, our social mores or norms or raising ourselves or anything like that, because it's important that we have laws and codes of conduct and ways to show up. But what happens, like what I mean by we start onto this world transformed is we, we grow, we come onto this planet fully expressed. There's no point where a baby is like, ah, is it appropriate for me to cry because I'm hungry? The baby just cries because they're hungry. I'm hungry. Here's the expression of my hunger. Um, and then over time, the child learns, mm, it's okay at this time of day to do that, but not that time of day. If mom's on the phone, don't cry because that will get you punished or ignored or whatever. And so this is what Buckminster Fuller is describing as degeniusizing. It's learning that there's places where my full expression is okay, and there's places where it's not okay. And this is done... This is made all the more complicated because we've conflated, we conflate responsibility with blame. So while the parent may be trying to teach us how to like, hey, it's appropriate to touch your genitals because it feels good, but not when you're in public. I don't know. I imagine that's something parents have to have a conversation with their kids about at some point. The, the parent is trying to teach the child some responsibility. There's an impact to the way you're showing up. But often we receive all of that through blame, in part because our parents have their own kind of blame and their own stories and what they were learned to never really move through. So this stuff just exists in our, in our nervous system and our energy and the way we show up. And so what we learn is like, oh, there's parts of myself that are great, parts of my natural expression that's amazing, and there's parts that's wrong. And there are parts of me that are not enough and should be more than they already are. So what happens from there is we create all these strategies we basically add stuff on to how we're already showing up in the world. We add on in these places, I need to be more than what's innate for myself. I need to like really show the fuck up in my brilliance. I'm brilliant, but I need to be way more. And in other places we learn, oh, I take up too much space naturally, so I need to dim myself down. 
So where either of those is kind of doing something other than what's innate for us, either it's turning ourselves down or turning ourselves up. So let's take the example of someone who is adventure. That's part of the qualities they bring into the world. And this part, I should say, that is part of what is emphasized about the qualities they bring into the world. Every human being has a capacity. Hey, Maria, nice to see you. Every human being has a capacity for all ways of being, all qualities of being. We are infinite in our scope of expression and capacity to be expressed, which is amazing. And we, just like your hair has a direction it parts itself naturally, our qualities of being have natural weight, like sort of, you could think of like spikes, strong suits. You can probably get, hopefully from knowing me, that wit and brilliance are two of the qualities I have strong suits in. It doesn't mean I don't have the capacity for divinity or generosity or anything else. Those just are less the strong suits of Adam. So now we've got this person we're looking at, Reggie, of course. And Reggie is is adventure to the core. You put Reggie on a project, it's going to be more adventurous than otherwise. Reggie is naturally drawn towards doing crazy things like dropping everything and moving to Japan and learning Japanese just like that where someone with brilliance would probably be more inclined if they were called towards learning Japanese to learn it a whole bunch in a book and to take classes and to do stuff like that. So same sort of like end goal, different expressions to get to that goal based on who we be innately. So Reggie learns going up, growing up in his life that his adventure isn't always a good thing. Sometimes his adventure creates problems. Sometimes he's like, let's move to Japan. And then he moves to Japan and he's like, I can't even read the signs. And then he gets robbed by the Yakuza. And then he has to like live homeless for a month. And it makes a cool story, but it's terrifying and horrible. And he comes home and people are like, wow, that was stupid. And he takes that on board. So in this admittedly bizarre, somewhat dramatic example I'm crafting, Reggie's going to learn my adventure is a liability. What's natural for me or, or what I might just take on naturally and it's a bit dangerous. And I don't know that I can trust myself. And so Reggie learns to start to disown what's innate for himself. He doesn't sort of look at it with much nuance. He looks at it quite bluntly. Ah, in these circumstances, in these particular situations around these particular kinds of people, this part of myself is not to be trusted. And so he learns to turn down his adventure. He learns to play it safe. He learns to research heavily. He learns to do all of this kind of stuff. Now. He's been doing that for 30 years, and he's a 43-year-old man, and we're going to look at where Reggie finds himself, because this brings us to this idea of allowing versus forcing, or allowing versus kind of doing, or trying to create, or performing, or whatever. Reggie finds himself bored out of his mind at work. He's like, ah, oh, it's I do everything safe. My work is totally safe. I'm working for the government. I've got a pension. I put in 15 more years and then I can retire. There's no mystery to it. It's completely planned, which is exactly what Reggie's fear about himself would require. Remember, his fear is that he's learned is I'm a not, I can't trust myself. I'm too risky. So he's created this life that's a response to that story. This life is you're risky. So be very safe. Be very blah, blah, blah. Do all this. So Reggie's created this totally safe life at least as far as his career is concerned, and he's living in it and he's miserable because it's the complete negation of who he is naturally, adventure. So none of this is distinguished for Reggie. Remember, we've pulled apart these threads and kind of looking at the pattern and how it got created. But for Reggie, he doesn't see any of this. This has all just sort of happened below his consciousness. So what Reggie concludes or notices or experiences is life's boring. My work is really like safe. I need to be riskier. And so what Reggie does is he goes out looking for opportunities to take risks, which is a little bit like if you imagine who Reggie is, is adventure, who Reggie has learned to be in response to his fears about his natural self and his inability to trust what's innate for him, how he's, who he's learned to be is safe protected, contained, predictable. And then in reaction to that way of showing up in his life, he's going to now try to sort of 
paint over top of it risk taking. So he might go and like do bungee jumping at 50 and it's crazy. Or he might go and like start taking risky bets in the stock market. Uh, 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 uh. For those listening, I'm gesturing with my hands and grunting because it's fun. Uh, uh, uh. So that's that top layer that he's putting over top of his, com- hey, Sarah, his compensation strategies. That's the forcing. That's Reggie trying to inject adventure into his life. The irony of that is that who Reggie is, is adventure. He just long ago forgot about that. So all of the attempts to like do something risky, to put adventure into his life, they're going to give him kind of like a bit of a hit, just like taking a drug will give you a bit of a hit, but it's never going to really give him the deep internal innate experience of adventure that is his birthright that he longs for. Instead, it's going to give him like, when I do that activity, I kind of feel alive again. So I need to structure my life with more and more of those activities. And then instead of his life being about the adventure he is innately and embodied as, his life becomes about seeking out more and more of these circumstances. So ultimately, the best Reggie ever gets is proximate. He gets to have an experience of something when he goes and finds these circumstances, but this isn't something like this that he's living as. He's not living as adventure. He is creating pockets of adventure over top of the safety that he's created to shut down his innate sense of adventure. So all of the strategies, all of the stuff he layers on top actually reinforces his safety. It reinforces his disowning of himself. He reinforces his inability to trust what's there innately for him because he puts these on top and he's like, oh, it feels kind of good. I can kind of like, I think I'm getting back to myself. In fact, Reggie, you're getting further and further away from yourself. When people talk about being a diamond covered in dog poo and then putting nail polish on top, that's what's happening. That's what we're describing here. And so what would really set uh, Reggie free is starting to notice his innate adventurousness that's already there. And then notice how he quells it. Notice how he shuts that part of himself down. There's no forcing. He doesn't have to perform risk. He doesn't have to go and search for it out there because the thrill of risk and reward exists inside of him. And so what really sets Reggie free is to kind of let go of this need to fabricate a sense of risk or adventure and instead to slow down and be willing to really like, huh, I can feel in this moment my desire to go do this crazy thing. And here's this part of my head now explaining for five hours why that's not a good idea. And now I'm going down the path of my head. This is the nature of allowing. If Reggie can start to notice how often he shuts down this adventure rather than trying to force it into his life, then over time, he's going to start to realize all the places where that's no longer serving him. And as he starts to do that, he's going to be able to make the courageous choice of choosing something different. Oh, it doesn't serve. I, I, damn it. I'm not willing to keep clinging here. I'm not willing to keep shutting down my adventure. In this situation, I'm going to practice letting myself follow what's naturally there for me. That's the nature of allowing. Transformation is always a process of allowing what is already there to come forward rather than piling stuff on top of the strategies that we've layered on top of disowning who we are naturally. This is why the vast majority like 99% of attempts at changing ourselves fail is because they are a, they're like circumstances, they're events, they're sort of us trying to layer something on top of all of the strategies we've created to disown who we are naturally. So people are like, ah, oh, um, well, like Reggie, right? He's going to like New Year's resolution, I'm going to be riskier. And he starts making risky investments that's not ever going to bring Reggie closer to what's naturally there for himself. It's going to just have him create sort of like little moments of high over top of the doldrums that he's created for himself. And so even if he does do that, at first it's going to feel very thrilling for him, but it's got a very short half-life. And this is why people don't naturally create transformation by ourselves, just from an earnest desire to change. Most of our earnest desires to change are actually in alignment with further reinforcing the very scaffolding that has us feeling so crappy in the first place. 
Okay. Um, Andrew, just coming back to your comment previously, thanks for speaking to the clearing exercise. I found the impact of it has dissipated over time, likely my righteousness getting in the way. It's an interesting way to look at how the energy I'm sending out needs to be cleared. I haven't thought of it that way. The other way I like to hold it, Andrew, is I'm getting clear on what's there. I'm not necessarily clearing it out as in removing it forever. I'm just getting clear. So most of our attempts, you know, like if you look at a lot of what is being peddled as coaching, there's a lot of people trying to help you not have fear. That's a bit of a fool's errand. What we really want to do is learn how to be okay, or even more succinctly, to learn how to be with our fear. So we're like, okay, got it. I have fear. I'm clear on that now. I'm no longer operating over top of it. And now that I'm clear on it, I can choose whether or not I let that dictate my actions. Oh, I'm afraid. And what my fear is telling me to do is to cancel this networking event I'm going to and do this other thing over here. Do I want to choose based on my fear? Sometimes you'll choose yes. Other times you'll choose no. But that choice only becomes available to you once you've gotten clear that fear is in the space for you. And so that's the freedom that this kind of stuff can provide. Uh, Carla, that's very similar to what happened when I lived in Malaysia and came back to Peru. I love Peru. I started to distrust my proactivity, leadership, and critical thinking. It took me some time to learn how to own it in a healthier way. Cool. Nice work learning how to own it in a healthier way. Let's have a sip of tea. <clears throat> Who's pulled up? Oh, my gardener's here. Okay. You can be here, gardener. Um, let's talk about Raphael's question or request. Raphael says, can you talk about the dance between staying connected to possibility and having slash being enough? Yes, I can. And it's a great one. So most of us people, most of you humans, we kind of operate in one of two places. It's a bit binary. One is attached to our striving. So the flavor of that is I want a nice house, for example, or I want a million dollars and I don't have that yet. So that creates a gap between what we desire and where we are. And the, the gap between those two things creates a degree of heartbreak. There's always going to be a degree of heartbreak. I'm using that term broadly. It's not like you will sit there and sob for days and days, although you may. I just mean that there's a degree of heartbreak between what is currently and what could be. Anytime you get present to possibility, this heartbreak will show up. You've probably noticed this, maybe not experienced it as heartbreak, but when you can see something as possible for like your parents or your children or your friends, you're like, ah, you could be amazing and you're not. Why don't you just stop doing that? And then what happens is we try to like, shove them into it or give them advice, all of which is basically a strategy born out of our heartbreak. There's heartbreak that this person could be here, but in fact are there. I don't want to feel that heartbreak. How do I support them to get there? So it doesn't necessarily occur like heartbreak to us. It might occur like a genuine desire to help people or like frustration with the fact that they keep fucking around or anything along that spectrum. But I would assert that underneath all of that, ultimately what is going on is we are heartbroken by the fact that there is possibility available and here's where we are. So many of us, the one, the first position that we start in or, or that we occupy as humans is we are striving towards something and we are not there yet. And from there, we get kind of attached and crappy and life doesn't feel that fun. We're like, ah, this sucks. If only I had that million dollars. If only I had that house. Look at my crappy house right now. I hate where I live. It sucks, blah, 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 blah. That's the conversation that's ongoing. So many of you will be able to relate to this. I certainly have. If if I got that promotion, then things would be better. If I got that boyfriend that really loved me, then things would be different. If my partner really showed up the way I need them to show up, then the relationship would be the way it's meant to be, and so on and so forth. If this, then this. And the second this is like, sorry, let me say that better. If this, then that. And that is the experience I really want. So in this first place, this first position I'm talking about, we are striving for something. We have a drive towards something, but it's a little bit born out of an inability to be at peace with where we are currently. 
That's position one. Position two is at the other end of the spectrum. It's like we take this big switch and go, clack. Position two is we are completely devoid of that striving. So rather than have to sit with the heartbreak of this gap and however we show up from heartbreak, discomfort, frustration with other people, frustration with ourselves, giving advice, seeking advice, trying to figure it out, not you know all of that stuff. Instead, what we do is we take our expectations and we go, bing. So in the first position, what we're trying to do is move where we are to where our expectations or the possibility is, and then we don't have to feel the heartbreak of that gap. In the second position we're describing here, instead of what we do is we diminish or eliminate our expectations. I don't need anything to be different. And further, I'm going to release all expectation or striving towards it whatsoever. So in this example, this is you, you often see this in, um, or I often see this in yogic communities. I see the first position a lot in high performance, leadership, executive positions, so on and so forth. These are people that are working like Wolf of Wall Street kind of stuff. They're working so hard and they're miserable, but they're creating amazing results and they keep getting further and further and further. But of course, it's never enough. The second position tends to be more in communities that um, will refer to themselves as conscious communities, uh, yogic communities. Um, and in some Zen cultures, they would call this like the stink of Zen. And so what happens here is that people are totally content with where they are, but they've done so by killing their, their desire for what's next. And I want to be really clear this is a fundamental part of the human spirit. So part of our humanity, part of what got us here, part of what keeps us moving forward is that the human spirit has a fundamental striving towards something beyond where we currently are. Striving, not from like, I don't mean that word in terms of like frustration or there's something wrong with where we are currently, but I just mean like the ability that we have to see beyond where we are right now and to see possibility in that. That is a beautiful, fundamental part of the human spirit. So this second position is what we would call complacent contentment. This is where people are, will say things like, I'm completely content with the way things are, and I have no desire for anything to be different. Cool. So now what? I don't know. I'll wake up tomorrow and we'll see. It's important I say here, neither of these two positions is wrong. No one needs to shift off of these positions whatsoever. More so, I have no desire in convincing people to shift off of these two positions. Our job as leaders and coaches is simply to support people to create what's next in their life if they choose it. The cost of this second position tends to be an experience of low-grade guilt and like frustration. And the reason for that is because, remember, a fundamental part of the human spirit is seeing this gap. It is seeing what's possible. And what these people are doing is they're unconsciously suppressing that part of themselves. They're, they're diminishing the possibility that they can see unconsciously, ostensibly in the name of being content with where they're at. But the impact of that is that there's a part of them that's like, but there could be more. And so they have to manage that, like holding a beach ball underwater. Uh, there could be more. Let's be totally content here. So often these people will show up in coaching kind of like a lot of what they'll bring will be like, I, I just want to be okay with how good my life is. I just want to not feel bad about what my life is like. And what's really at play is they, it's not that they feel bad about how good their life is, it's that there is a part of themselves that they're actively sabotaging, diminishing, suppressing. And that creates an experience of guilt. It creates this experience like there should be more. There's a part of their human spirit that's like, there's more available. But in order to not have to have the experience of the heartbreak that this gap creates, they have learned to come down here and be totally complacent. So these are the two poles that people tend to be on, like a binary switch. 
There's no ability to transcend one or the other. They go from here all the way to here, all the way to back. And so if you ever read books like The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari, you can, there's a lot of this from one end to the other in that. A lot of The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari is really like about someone in the first position going all the way to the second position. He gives everything away and now he's totally at peace and he gets up at four in the morning and he wears weird robes. <laughs> I never really loved that book, as you can tell. I think it presents, I think it reinforces this binary thing. And so what happens when you are presented, when your life becomes limited to these two choices, people tend to play one off against the other. So like when they're in that complacent realm, they're like, well, I just don't want to become harried and intense like I used to when I was an executive. So at least uh, this is better. This is where I'm going to stay. The harried intensity is how they've learned to show up from the heartbreak created by this gap between what is and what could be. Uh, Raphael just saying here, um, the knife edge seems to be accepting things as they are while continuing to work on improving our circumstances. Y yes, in terms of like our doing. So that's like the doing of it and and like some of the being too, you're right. Um, but I'm gonna go a little deeper into this. But on the surface, you're absolutely right, Raphael. How can I simultaneously be at peace and love life exactly as it is without needing it to be any different while continuing to honor and allow to, to soar that fundamental part of my own human spirit? How can I do that? How do we have space for both of these things simultaneously? And you'll notice that on each side of this, it's very binary and linear. It's either, I can't even live in the present. I got to fucking get here. So you're all in the future. Or the other one is, I can't have any future. I am totally here in the present with no drive. I'll just, I'm like a cork in the ocean. I'll bounce here and there and, and everywhere. This second position, by the way, is where a lot of people kind of place themselves when they read the surrender experiment and don't really understand too well, like the depth of what's going on in that book. Well, so Evan's asking a great question. Do I believe the soaring happens inevitably anyway? And I think what you're asking Evan is like in this second position of, uh, what did I call it? Uh, complacent contentment. Do I believe people soar anyway? Like, do they still strive? I think what happens is they, I think humans are incredibly adaptive and that when people have learned that having this ability to see possibility is a problem and gets in the way of their complacent contentment, what they end up doing in their life is continuing to push that beach ball underwater. So they, they feel more and more degrees of low grade guilt, more and more degrees of low grade fr frustration. And, um, Ultimately, what's happening is a degree of resignation. Their, their life is kind of resigned because they're resigned like, I can't really strive. I have to like be okay with things exactly as they are. That's the path. So I don't think they inevitably soar in the sense like they start creating magical, wonderful, amazing things. But I do believe that the human spirit inevitably desires something beyond where we're at. And so that feeling inevitably will continue to show up. Their life ultimately becomes about how do I stop that from really showing up much of my life and keep that underwater and then create the best life I can from that kind of complacent contentment. Back to what you had said, Raf. The knife edge seems to be accepting things as they are while continuing to work on improving our circumstances. So how do we do that? How do we simultaneously be totally at peace with where we're at and not need anything to change while also, what the, oh, so my friend calling me uh, an hour earlier because he's uh, mountain time. So how do we do that? How do we keep both of these things present for ourselves? And you may or may not already be here with me. The way we do that is by developing our capacity to be with our heartbreak. If this inevitably, if the ability to see what's possible in the future is inevitably going to be about creating, like is inevitably going to create a degree of heartbreak because we can see what's available and we can see where we are, then what we must learn to do is to simply be heartbroken. 
And if you read this book that I'm going to pull off my shelf and show to you, where is it? I know it has an ugly, here it is. Such an ugly color cover. Shambhala by Chogyang Trungpa. If you read this brilliant book, I highly recommend this for men doing men's work or anyone wanting to learn more about like the path of being a warrior for love. What Chogyam tells you is that as you deepen your ability to feel more and more into life, as you develop your ability to like be less and less defended and more and more open to everything that is, you will discover a fundamental inherent heartbreak to being alive. And that heartbreak is a function of the fact that no matter how intimate you and I get, no matter how much I open myself to the world, there is a fundamental gap between you and I. There is a degree to which I can never fully get over there with you. And that means that there is a fundamental inherent loneliness to this life. Not like, therefore, might as well go live in a cave because it's so lonely and blah, blah, blah. Rather, there is just an inherent degree of heartbreak. And, and like, we don't have to walk very far, metaphorically speaking, to get this, right? Like, you are going to die, as am I. The universe at some point is going to end in a big rip. Everything completely reduced to um, entropic chaos and atoms being pulled apart because the universe continues to expand and no matter ever being able to create ever again and eventually just dies in a slow heat death. That's heartbreaking. Not wrong, just heartbreaking. And so to really step out of these two binary places requires us cultivating a capacity to simply be with heartbreak. What that means is when you notice your friend and what they're capable of, and when you see where they are hanging out, not stepping into what they're capable of, instead of trying to give them advice or push them towards what's next or do any of that stuff, you take on a practice of being willing to, to let yourself feel the heartbreak that, that causes for you without doing anything to change it. And what happens from there is that you start learning and developing the capacity to see like heartbreak's not wrong. And in fact, heartbreak serves me in deepening, just like death isn't bad or wrong and it serves us to live our lives more fully. And so from there, this ability to see what's possible stops being a problem. It stops being the problem that would have us live only complacently in the present. Instead, we can be like, wow, this could be available to me. And I could go for that. And there might be heartbreak because I don't get there as fast as I want or I don't experience what I want. But I can be with that heartbreak and remain totally content right now. What most people are doing in the second camp, the complacent contentment, is they are unable to be with their own heartbreak. And so in order to be able to function because of this atrophied muscle and being heartbroken, they take away all of their hopes and dreams. They quell that part of their heart's song, their soul's desire and just hang out here. There's no heartbreak in living a pretty good life. None. But there's also not a lot of love. There's a lot of, um, there's no heartbreak, but there's a lot of low-grade frustration and guilt. There's no love, but there's a lot of like, like. There's a lot of life's pretty good. There's, there's no 10 out of 10s, but there's a lot of eight out of 10s. There's no zero out of 10s, but there's a lot of two out of 10s. And so that's, that's the nature of this sort of stuff. We basically take the entire curvature, the full range of expression of human beings, and we flatten that curve. We grab it by the ends and pull it taut. And then we can kind of live in the four out of five, five out of five, six out of 10. And then it's like, yeah, it's, it's a good life. It's not a bad life. And none of this is wrong, remember. It's simply that if we want to live a full, fully expressed life, all of this is part of it. Um, Evan saying, I'm just going to put you up here. Heartbreak isn't a might. Evan, meaning it's not like we might feel heartbroken. I think it's guaranteed. As we step deeper into layers of being, heartbreak is part of growing into ourselves. Absolutely. The I guess the counterpart I might say to that is the more we turn off our ability to feel, the less we have to experience heartbreak. It doesn't mean that it's not there. Just like turning off your ability to feel doesn't mean that you don't experience love. It just means, or it doesn't mean that you don't have the capacity for it. It just means you've diminished your ability to actually experience any of it. So a lot of the people in this like complacent contentment, they're, they're actually walking around fairly heartbroken, resigned, 
using the language of being empowered over top of their resign, I'm okay with the fact that l- this is how life is. And I'm just working to be pleased with exactly what I have. That's actually resignation. Not not bad, just resignation. And it's over top of like this low grade kind of continuous heartbreak in their life. Uh, Andrew saying, I play a lot in the land of eights and then a few ones, twos, and zeros. Still looking for that mysterious formula. When I first got trained and the start of my training was like a big punch between the eyes done with kindness and the utmost of love, but also a great deal of power, meaning I'd committed to be in this program for a year. And at the start of this year, they're like, great, Adam's committed to this. We're here to support him transforming. So we're going to bring some powerful reflection right out of the gate. Otherwise, why are we doing this? If, if we're going to create transformation, let's create transformation. And one of the things that was said to me, the woman who's currently my, my wife's coach and has played a tremendous role in developing and supporting my own leadership, Jody Jan Larson, her and another man, Christopher McAuliffe, were, were working with me in the moment in front of the room. And Jody asked me, have you ever been devastated by love, Adam? And my response was, I don't even know what that means. So I'm going to go ahead and say no. And that was completely true. I, I had never really been devastated by love. Um, I could explain to you why I like using words, why I loved my wife a lot. I could explain to you how I like, I could argue like a lawyer about the notion of love really well, but I had no capacity to be devastated by it because I'd shut that off because it was unsafe. I didn't want to feel heartbreak. So I'd learned really effectively to eliminate that from my life. And what eliminating heartbreak did is it eliminated love from my life. And so love was this nice, clean, fairly um, sanitized experience. I could talk about it in really articulate detail, but what would always be missing from me talking about it in really articulate detail is like the level of experience and of being open-hearted that would leave me completely unable to articulate anything because of being devastated and just swept away by love. Yeah, I have insanitary love. (laughs) A poem, maybe a poem, maybe a good book. Okay, um, let's finish up with what you've asked about, Andrew, which is a discussion around diving deeper into commitment as part of enrollment. So Andrew is saying, I get to have great conversations with many folks who see the possibility, meaning they see something available for themselves. But and at times, things will get in the way of that. So to better support them and also understand the deeper levels, the deeper levels of commitment from my vantage point as a coach. So I think what you mean there, Andrew, is like, so what can you talk more about how commitment and enrollment works? So the, the first thing we want to understand is anytime, what Andrew's talking about when he says like people will get present to possibility is there's a life in front of you that's predictably yours to create. It doesn't require any work on your part. It doesn't require any breakthroughs and you will create it. It might require that you do a bunch of work. It might require that you rearrange the furniture in the apartment of your life, so to speak. What I mean by that is if you're currently spending five hours a day watching TV, it might require you spend five hours a day doing something else. Or if you're currently working really hard studying for something and you want to do a different career, it might require that you double down on what you are already good at doing, working really hard studying for something. So this is. Most of when people set goals for themselves, they set a goal that's entirely inside this cone of predictability. The goal being like, okay, if I did, if I worked twice as hard and if I cut back on my sleep, I'm willing to do that. It won't be fun, but I could do it for a few years. Then I could achieve this result. Great. I'm going to go after that result. I hope I get it. You predictably will. So that's how most of us set goals. There are goals that will require something from us. They're not like snap your fingers and get it. But what they require, require it doesn't demand a breakthrough in any way. We don't have to change fundamentally the way we show up in our life to achieve it. Possibility exists outside of that cone of predictability. So when you sit down and talk with a coach or with a leader 
and they start to say, let's look at what's possible for you. What they're really inviting you to do is to look at something being possible in your life that is outside of what you could create on your own. That is outside of the stories that you've created about what is and is not possible for you. So the example I often give is like, I could talk to a lawyer who is working 60 hours a week and making $200,000 a year. And they might say, look, I'd really like less time. So what I want to do is work half as much and make half as much. So I'll work 30 hours a week and I'll make $100,000 a year. That's entire, that, Can you see how that's just rearranging the things in the same equation, right? They're like, cut my time in half, work half as many hours, get half the salary. I can learn to be okay with that. But there's no breakthrough there. They're still inside the same box, the same paradigm. They're just rearranging it. On the other hand, if you were to have a conversation with them and really took a look and they kind of got to the point where they're like, well, I want to work half as much, but make twice as much. I want to work 30 hours a week, but make $400,000 a year. That would require some kind of breakthrough. That is not, there's no room for that inside their current box through which they relate to the world. Their cone of predictability doesn't have that inside of it. So as coach, as leader, that's what we're seeking to enroll people in. That kind of result is the reason someone would take on the terribly scary, challenging, confronting work of transformation. The cut your hours in half, make half as much money. There's no reason to take on transformation from that lens. You might think, oh, well, a breakthrough would be cool and I want to be the best person I can be. But your fear is much sharper than you or I or any of us give it credit for. And come the moment when it's like, great, now you got to step over the threshold. We are very reliable to be like, eh, you know what? I think I'm okay. Just, I don't, maybe next year. I've been thinking about it and my life actually isn't that bad, right? We find our way to go back. So Andrew, whenever you create possibility for someone, meaning whenever you support someone to see some kind of possibility in their life that exists outside of that cone of predictability, it's going to bring with it a degree of fear. They're going to have some fear because fear is the very reason we haven't created that in the first place. And if you'd like to see that, check out the energetic laws on fear and possibility. So I've posted the link in the comments here. Go read the first energetic law. I think it's the first one, fear and possibility. And you'll get an understanding of why anytime we aim towards possibility, fear is going to show up. So anytime fear shows up for someone, of course, stuff's going to get in the way of it. Of course. So what people will often do is they'll tell themselves like, well, I just need to start having a conversation with people that are more committed to changing their lives. That's missing the point entirely. The problem is that you've brought your client up to the front of the diving board and now they're looking out and they can see how far down it is. And they're present to like all the things that could go wrong and they're scared. And as you look out over that diving board and be with your fear, there's more and more reasons why getting down and walking off the diving board makes more and more sense. So the place that we want to show up with our clients here, with our direct reports, with those we manage is not to try to hammer commitment into their head. It's to, it's to really sit with them and get curious about their fear and give them the space to talk through it and to sort of explain it so they can see there are two choices available. One is along the path of fear, and that is a totally acceptable choice. And the path of fear is going to have predictable results. They'll probably keep doing the same thing. They'll have the same complaints. There's a way it's going to go. And there's another choice that means stepping out into their fear. That means stepping into the possibility that their fear is currently blocking. And there's a way that that will predictably go. And all we really want to do is support them to get clear on that. Um. The way you've asked this question, Andrew, is like, can you have a discussion around diving deeper into commitment as a part of an enrollment? I'm not totally clear. I guess I'd need a little bit more from you to go any deeper than this, because the, the heart of this is ultimately about people being willing to confront their fear. What I will say is that once we start with someone, so once someone begins working with me, which is usually a year and a bunch of money. The first thing we do is we create agreements. And one of the first things I go over in our agreements is the agreement around quitting. And that agreement is 
that we, my client and I both recognize and acknowledge that transformation requires stepping into our fear. And when we are confronted by our fear, we will want to quit whatever it is that is standing for us to keep going through our fear. So in this case, that's the coaching. The moment someone is confronted by their fear, they're naturally going to want to leave the coaching because the coaching is pushing them towards their fear and that's scary. And so the client and I are acknowledging that's going to be the case and acknowledging that in service of their transformation, that, that they are a yes to being in a conversation with me to support them choosing back into their coaching, even though in the moment that may not be the conversation they would want to have. So that's them making a commitment in that moment. They're making a commitment saying, I recognize that I'm going to get derailed. I'm going to get scared. I'm going to get taken out. And knowing from here that that's going to happen, I'm making a commitment to be in a conversation with Adam to support me in continuing to choose into what's scary rather than choosing out towards what's safe and what's comfortable. So that's kind of like part of the commitment. Um, yeah, you'll have to, it, I'm not sure if you're still here, but if, if you provide any, um, oh, there you are. If you're providing, if you can provide me a little bit of uh, elaboration, I can give you a better answer. Here's, let's, let's read what Andrew's written. He's just shared a bit more. One of the places I think I'm looking at is how to better support people in their fear. Sometimes I get hung up on the surface level thing as opposed to looking at what might be behind some of those beliefs with money. Yeah. Um, the So one, there's an infographic I have around this that you may have seen, Andrew. Uh, I'll post in the comments either way called supporting the yes or maybe getting your client to yes. The So what most people do, most sales approaches offer you to do is like, what's in the way? Money. Okay. If money wasn't in the way, would you be a yes? Yes. Great. Let's figure out how you can get money. So they're on the surface. They're in the weeds of what's going on. But the heart of our fear is like money is actually, it's not really about money. It's some story underneath the surface about ourselves. So what what, how does it go with money? And what's the concern? What is this really about it? Like, what is your story about money? What does, what do you believe to be true about you and money? And if you start to explore these things, you're going to start to find people be like, well, I don't trust myself to make wise financial investments. Or my story is I kind of am really uh, impulsive with my spending. Great. And then we can start, so we're not trying to figure out how to find money in their bank account to do this because that would just be continuing to operate on the surface and miss all of this richness that's here for this person to discover about themselves. So instead, what's the thing in the way with money? Well, I'm worried. I, I, I don't think I make prudent financial decisions and I think I'm impulsive with it. Great. Okay, great. See you, Raph. Thanks for hanging around. What do you do as a result of that belief about yourself? Well, I tend not to, like when I'm confronted with decisions, I tend to delay and delay and delay. Okay, great. And then what happens? Well, I get tired of, so all we're doing is we're looking at the pattern of how does it go? What does that belief provide you? And as you continue to do this, you're supporting your client to just see the deeper context. You're supporting them to see the forest for the trees. And that's, that's what we do as coach with everything. We're never trying to make someone do something. We're supporting them to see with altitude what's going on in their life, the pattern that they're caught in, so they can choose to keep doing it or choose not to. So all you're really supporting your client to do is see the pattern with money. How does this go? What's predictable? How does this end up back here next week or next year? And from there, your client has more power to make a different choice. So if you want to, Andrew, if you want to like get more specific with any of this, you can ask me, like, let me know. But um, that's about as general as I can speak to on this stuff without a little more um, direction. 1126. Well, I've got a little more tea left. I kind of want to talk about the performance of something versus the being of it. But I also noticed that we've got, we've whittled down to about five viewers. So I think I'm going to, I think we're going to wind down there. Um, let's see, I'm going to plug some stuff. What can I plug? Uh, next week on the live show, we've got Kayla MacArthur, who's a two-time Forge graduate. So she's been through the pro program, uh, 
two times with us. She's awesome. She's currently living in <laughs> heaven. Uh, I appreciate you, man. Uh, Kayla's currently living in Mexico, I believe, with her boyfriend, does a lot of cool travel stuff. Uh, so she'll be on the show next week. Um, the Forge, we keep having uh, people reach out and say, hey, I'd like to be on that that um, waiting list. So all that the waiting list is, is it's um, when we open the doors for registration, which will probably be March, April, sometime around there. You're the first person that we say, hey, by the way, this is available. Let me know if you'd like something. And it also, um, by you saying, hey, can I be on that list? You're kind of, um, you're starting relationship with me to some extent. And what that allows us both to, do, to, to kind of do is be in a conversation with one another. Great. What can I, is there anything I can tell you about it? Is there any questions you have? Is there anything you'd like to know? And so you get to kind of start to get your ducks in a row and really move yourself towards a decision one way or the other, rather than waiting um, waiting until, like what we tend to do is because these decisions are often scary, we wait until the doors are open and then we sort of sit in our process. And then you know what's happened to a number of people over the years is like, we fill up and they're like, oh, if only. So the invitation I have is like, if, and, and you'll see Evan in the comments, definitely in for next year, which I would love Evan. That's really exciting for us. And, um, and uh, so, you know, just follow these people, follow Evan, follow Kayla. They're up to amazing things. Follow Raphael. You'll see them in the comments because they're going through this work with us and start your process. Now, reach out to me if this is something you're interested in so we can begin the conversation and support you in really making a powerful, empowered decision, really feeling like, fuck, yeah, I feel great about being a yes, or I feel great about being a no. Either one of those is an amazing place to arrive at. So um, plug in the forge, let me know, send me a message or send Bay a message and do follow the people I've mentioned. Follow Evan, follow uh, Raphael, follow, is there anyone else here that's been commenting? Uh, follow Sarah. Uh, and I think we had Mia here originally. Um, follow these people because they're up to amazing things and they're th they're going through a transformational process themselves, which is really cool. And you'll start to see them share in new ways as they as they take on their breakthroughs. Yeah, Heather, thank you, Evan. Follow Heather, absolutely. So there's that. Um, and if you don't already, check out Get Lit. All of the live shows are put on Get Lit. That's the podcast, my podcast. And we also, every week I do a distinction that's usually a half hour talking about something in leadership that tends to be missed in the mainstream. Missed meaning like, uh, oh, the right way to be a leader is servant leadership. And then we look at that and like, what is the nuance that gets missed in this kind of absolute right way to be a leader? So um, it's often... A really cool conversation that I think, at least for me and hopefully for other people, is like kind of eye-opening, like, oh, snap, I never thought about that. So the aim there is that you become much more nuanced in how you see leadership and, and visualize it and learn about it. Okay, last plug, read this book, Shambhala by Chogyam Trungpa. Amazing book, fascinating guy, so wise, so incredible, died at the age of 48 from severe cirrhosis of the liver because he was a massive alcoholic. And there's stories about him, um, people saying like, I had Chogyam staying at my place. He would drink a pint glass of gin in the morning. He would be so drunk, I would have to help him out to his, his cushion. And then he would sit and deliver a crystal clear teaching. And then I would carry him off his cushion. I'm not advocating for that at all. And I think that's problematic as a teacher. But I also think that there is a poetic beauty in that, in the sense that this is a man who's such a great embodiment of our humanity, so brilliant, so wise, and yet we can't seem to save ourselves from our own destruction. So really great book. No, I haven't, Evan. Thanks for, I'm going to watch it now. Crazy Wisdom. That's awesome. Love you guys. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you next week with Kayla. Have an awesome weekend. Weekend. I said that weird. Bye for now.